Okay, folks, here we are. We're, we're still doing the earthquake model with deep learning. And we are, this is the fourth part of this sequence of five parts. And here we're going to describe what we actually feed into the deep learning model and what it actually outputs. Okay, let's get going. So, what you're doing is you're having, remember this operator. The properties of the things you feed into the operator and the predictions of the things you get out. Uh, with inference, the prediction is what you're predicting, and for tr for training, the prediction is what you're going to uh, put into your loss function to optimize. So the, these come from actually the, effectively the same set of data, um, and, but they come correspond to different times. Then the the properties are the earthquakes now, and the predictions of the earthquakes in the future. That's a rather crude. Um, Comment because for both cases we want to consider although we have sequences based on two week data we do something which is possibly controversial and may not be approved of uh, namely we associate with every time point not just that two week value but also longer time intervals like the last year or and we predict not just the next two weeks we predict the next year and so on so. Here we have the data, which is going to go to properties and predictions. We have the data input in two week aggregations. We have static features, which in some problems like hydrology and the medical data, it can be quite a lot of that. In the case that we don't, we only have the, those um, space filling curve designations of faults, faults in this case here. Then we have the calculated quantities, which are actually unusually large for this part, because we're going to calculate these longer time averages with the moment four years as the maximum interval. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're currently just doing everything as log energy, but we want to look at the Benioff strain, which is the square root of energy, or a general power of energy, including in principal energy itself. We will also introduce this something which is again possibly controversial, mathematical expansion functions. As a child, I was taught to expand things in Fourier series and Legendre polynomials. So we'll use those, because that's what I learned. And we have no missing data. So actually that restricts what uh, properties we can use on um, the input data. As we don't want to throw away too much data, we throw away the first year and don't have any um, sequences starting in the first year, which means that we can associate with every every uh, input uh, sequence the average over the previous year. We're trying to teach it to do a year at a time and two years at a time. So we give it the past year and learn, train on that. And we're going to be also, I mean, that training on that as a property is fed in, fed through the network. And we're going to get out. What's going to happen in the in the future? And I pointed out that the we we can have missing data on output. So all we need to have is at least one R output value, which means we can take a sequence which ends on the last but one two week time interval. All right. Now here's some uh, terminology which comes from the Google Temporal Fusion Transformer. Um, so these are the observed inputs. That's what you actually measure for the COVID the medical example, or any medical example, daily infections and fatalities. Um, in the case of COVID, there are auxiliary variables, which are also observed, which are vaccination rates, measures of social distancing, and so on. And in the case of the earthquake case, we have auxiliary data, which are the pin multiplicity counts, either the total multiplicity, Magnitude greater than or equal to zero, or the magnet, this sort of really more sensitive measure of magnitude greater than 3.29. Then we take these observed inputs and we divide them into targets and unknown inputs. Unknown inputs are ones that you have to observe, and targets are those um, inputs which you also want to predict. Um, so. There's also this, as well as observed inputs, there are known inputs. What are those? Well, a good example is the faults. 
uh, the earthquake faults are known and they're known at all time. And uh, the other thing is, I pointed out we're going to have uh, properties which are mathematical. Well, math is math; it's known forever. Um, so, known inputs are ones that are known at every time. Observed inputs are only known when you observe them. And when you do a prediction, when you go to the future, you do not have any observed inputs. That's what you're predicting. Um, so, uh, like in the Google Temporal Fusion Transformer in a sales application, they use as uh, known inputs a measure of whether the day was a holiday or a weekend. That's a pretty interesting uh, uh, case. We will show how we do. Annual variations, as in hydrology, or maybe weekly variations, as in some medical cases. Um, so, targets are the functions of time we're trying to predict, and um, which are either truly in, truly measured directly, or they're synthetic. Um, so, where we just calculate them from the observed measured values. All right. So, this is quite this is quite rich. Okay, now we come to these mathematical expansion functions, which are known inputs because they're known once you give me the value of time. And you know, we just use our experience of previous times when, when you have something unknown, you often expand it in terms of of functions, sometimes called orthogonal polynomials or Fourier series. Those are two different types of functions, and we use both in this case here. So the first case was motivated by things like hydrology, which is a one-year time cycle. Natural is not the same each from year to year, but there's obviously spring in one year is correlated with spring in the next year, and so on. Um, for earthquakes, we don't have that uh, value, that regularity. For instance, uh, in the case of medical time series, uh, you get a, a weekly period because of the fact that data is only gathered properly during weekdays and things. But earthquakes is not like that. So we choose a rather more phenomenological approach. We just put these functions in and let the system use it if it wants. And we choose a, a periods from 16 weeks up to um, 128 weeks. That's uh, as described here. N equals 64 over two weeks is a 128 week period. Um, so. Um, we use both cosine and sine, so if we choose four values of n, we get eight properties. Cos theta and sine theta, where theta varies from 0 to 2 pi over these uh, regions. Then we also go back and then we look over the entire time range, 70 years. And we chop that 70 years up into, in, uh, we, we define a value cos theta here at this time, because we're going to use a Lagrange polynomial, which we love for, for its beautiful properties. They um, know that actually both cos theta, sine theta, and drum polynomials all lie between minus one and plus one. So again, that's nice because we want in our in what we do to keep things in this range around one, so the activation layers can really do their thing and crunch up things. So we just choose PL of cos theta, where L is the uh, index, and um, these polynomials, and that's um, L equals four is a for, for uh, polynomial and co co up, co up to cos to the fourth theta. And we define theta to run between minus pi and zero. So cos theta goes from minus one to plus one over the full time range. And um, we happen to use these both in properties and predictions for the first two problem my methods we did, the LSTM and science transformer. The TFT seemed a bit stricter on what it what it used for predictions, so we just use these in in properties. It's not obvious to me whether you should put them in predictions or not. We're, we're trying to train it to obey these mathematical functions. Maybe you should try to predict them. Okay, so this tells you all these inputs and outputs. Here is the TFT, which is exactly the same as the LSTM and Science Transformer except for the targets. There are many more targets for the uh, LSTM and um, uh, science transformer, um, because it has both these mathematical functions and also a much broader range of, um, of um, 
predict uh, the time intervals. Again, this was partly because we haven't really fully done the TFT. And for TFT, we restricted our study up to a, up to one year in the, in the future, whereas the other ones went up to four years. And uh, this may need to be re-examined, because it's not quite obvious. Because the TFT naturally predicts these two-week chunks up to whatever time you go into the future. But it has this interesting feature that although it's predicting these two-week chunks, because of the lack of commutation in addition and maximizing, uh, you can't calculate the one-year prediction from the 52, 26 two-week predictions. So the one-year prediction is actually independent of the two-week predictions. And quite how that's meant to be done with the TFT, uh, there are many, there are several choices there. And we made one choice, which will, which is you can look at the code or look at our paper to see. And it, it, it's a very simple choice. Whether it's the right choice, I don't know. Anyway, we have these static known inputs, the targets, which is four for the TFT and 24 for the other models. These um, dynamically known inputs, the, which are these uh, mathematical properties. And then we have these measured unknown uh, inputs, which are both the, which are energy average debt, multiplicity, multiplicity greater than 3.29. And then these log energies for 2, 4, 8, 14, 26, and 52 weeks. Uh, basically everything up to a year in natural chunking. Here is a picture of the architectures. The simplest is the recurrent neural net. It has, it comes out here at the top with an input layer. It has a dense and a layer with, a, with an activation here. And then it goes through, uh, this, sorry, this is the, this is the, here is the activation layer at this level here. Uh, there's an input of a size 128 here, which goes into the first little STM. It pops out 48, those 48 go to a second layer, and then it goes to a dense decoder with activation up to 128. Then that goes to uh, uh, the output predictions. Um, then the science transformer, it uh, is shown here. It has an attention-based, spatial temporal attention-based uh, encoder. And then actually the, actually the decoder is more or less the same as this thing here. Um, all the models have LSTM layers in them. They just use them in slightly different fashion. For the science transformer, the LSTM is just used in the final um, decoder. For the um, LSTM itself, it is both the encoder, we have an encoder and decoder, which are basically the LSTM access. Here we have in the next slide, the very complicated TFT picture coming from the TFT paper. Uh, it took me an awful long time to understand that. Um, and here we have an encoder, which is actually an LSTM using um, in all the inputs, including the observed ones, going to the past and current targets. And then we have a decoder, which only has known inputs, not the observed inputs, the ones that have to be measured. And that goes to future targets. So that's pretty interesting. Your decoder is feeding in the known inputs. That is something which is uh, a clever idea in the TFT, which was not used in the other models. Um, and then the static variables, which aren't so important for earthquakes. Um, are used to create context. Uh, when you do an LSTM, you can define a context. That is done with the static variables in the TFT. And we have um, the LSTM outputs uh, have a temporal transformer, which tries to find patterns with these various outputs, uh, with the encoder and decoder. And, and the TFT has very sophisticated encoding steps, which convert inputs into standard um, um, standard uh, layers. So that, but that's much done much better and more sophisticated than the LSTM and Science Transformer. And in fact, one should probably look at the LSTM and Science Transformer using these ideas from the TFT. As you see, this is work in progress.
Um, okay, now here's a little comment on search strategies. Uh, both TFT and science use transformers. These are things that look for patterns. For the TFT, the pattern is relatively simple. It just runs over the time within the sequence. But in the science transformer, it does the time and the space. So it runs across spatial position. That actually makes the um, input, uh, input sample larger for the uh, science um, transformer because it has to have both time values and space values. And so it tends to have not lots of lots of small sequences, one per spatial point. It has lots of spatial points in a single input sample. And that actually means that if you do the full, which is the, actually what I think is used in the presented fits, um, you have the number of space points involved, which is a sample of the space points. You can't fit all of them in, in, in at the time, times the window size. And this number here, it's number of space points times number of time window all squared, is pretty big. And you lose up lots of uh, GPU memory doing this. So the A100 with 80 gigabytes is particularly useful for this particular algorithm. Um, so here we have the total number of time values is 1785. Uh, we have, as before, 500 locations divided into 400 training and 100 um, sh shuffling. Sorry, 100 <laughs> validation. What a stupid comment. I was looking at this, uh, my mind was looking at this uh, bullet here. Everything is shuffled over sequences and divided up into batches of variable sizes. And um, we tend to use um, the number of sequences, the number of sequences is 500 times the number of time values, which is quite a lot. And you actually, if you make all the sequences up ahead of time, that uses up a huge amount of memory. And so we actually don't do that. Uh, for most of the analysis, we just use symbolic windows. We hand TensorFlow sequence definitions, not sequences. And so the um, sequences definitions are converted to sequences within after the batch has been formed. So this somewhat increases the compute time, but uh, it drastically reduces the memory. And I, this, the compute time used is, I think, 10% or something like that. It's not a huge amount. And this is perhaps an interesting technique as general value. Um, I already pointed out the sample sizes are different. For the TFT and LSTM, you have a typical batch of single, one time, one location samples where everything is shuffled. So they're all sort of randomly sampled from a complete shuffling of the 1785 times 400 um, uh, training values. However, for the science transformer, we just have a batch size of one because you're, you're you can't actually afford to have a bigger batch size. There's not enough memory. Because um, you, you need to put lots of space points in the, uh, in the sample. So, we, so I point out we can't actually include all the spatial values in the, um, with the current memory. So we sample everything, we do sampling. And so we just use, randomly choose different space-time sequences to be included in every batch. Now, this doesn't matter in training, because the batches just run over everything. So they just, and by, so everything is always statistical, everything, so it probably averages out. But it matters for inference. Because for inference, you have to do this statistical averaging, even though you only want one answer. So for inferencing, when you're inferring everything, it's okay, because you do want to do everything. But for inference, where you just happen to want a small number of values, then you have to actually do this increases the inference time very, very significantly. Um, I should note also a little comment here on time. The transformer involves a lot more computing than the LSTM, but it vectorizes on the GPU much better than the LSTM. And so the transformer is not significantly slower than the LSTM. 